Hey, well, hello. Welcome to The Garden Gurus Live. I'm Trevor Cochran. It's great to be joining you this morning. Apologies for last week. We were on Norfolk Island last week and we had a few challenges uh, with technology. Unfortunately, the uh, telephone lines and internet was down, so we weren't able to bring you the show. This week, we're bringing it to you from beautiful, what we call Mifkes, the Melbourne International Flower and Garden Show. And it's held here in Carlton Gardens, an absolutely stunning location. If you're in Victoria, it's a big weekend coming up. There's a lot going on. Make sure you come and check it out. Um, of course, uh, we've got a, a brand new series of uh, the Garden Gurus programs rolling through. And tomorrow is the next episode. I hope you can tune in. It's actually been quite refreshing. We've got a lot of very new and interesting stories coming through. And the guys are having a lot of fun presenting them. So I'd love to hear your feedback. And of course, if there's stories that you want to see produced and, and shown, then please let us know. We'd love to... Um, track them down. We've got a, a, a lovely long series ahead for you to be able to uh, tune into. And of course, it's on Channel 9. Check your local guides because we do know there's a little bit of variation in some states with regards to the actual time frame. So uh, let's have a bit of a think about, um, let's have a th little think about this particular show. I'll give you a sneak peek of it. Tell me what you think. You haven't got it? Oh, we haven't got it. Sorry. We're, are we all like, all good? Yeah, we'll have it later. Okay, we'll, we'll show you the promo a bit later on. I'm just reading through our notes here, but there are a few little technical challenges uh, with regards to producing this remotely as we are, and um, you'll have to forgive us if we make a, a few mistakes along the way. Now, um, we do have uh, the CEO of the nursery and garden industry will be joining us a bit later on, and I'll give you um, a bit of a rundown on that one uh, when we're ready to go. What we might do first up though this morning is actually run through uh, some of the questions that are coming through because you are sending them through thick and fast and uh, there's some rippers here. Um, the first one from Louise Gunn. Now Louise is in Sydney, New South Wales. She's got um, a no ID palm and is producing seeds from the pod. Um, this is a bit interesting, this one. It's showing in the shape of a pineapple. And if so, how? I don't think what you've got is a palm. I could be wrong, but I think you've got pandanus. And pandanus produces a big, large um, seed head, if you like, a big fruit um, that has seeds inside it that looks just like a pineapple, but it's not a pineapple. The good thing is those little red seeds or large red seeds definitely can be cultivated. What you've got to do is dry them and then uh, plant them. And look, do it in the warmer time of the year, not in the cooler time of the year with pandanus. This is a tropical plant and uh, it's absolutely stunning. And, and we're seeing it growing further south in Australia, more and more places like Perth. Once upon a time, you couldn't get them going. Um, Adelaide, I've seen them growing there. I've seen them growing in Melbourne too. They do have to be protected from severe cold, but if you've got a nice warm north facing wall, you're in with a pretty good chance. Hopefully that helps. Good morning, Tyson. Thanks very much for joining us this morning. Tyson Sanders, he's a, uh, he's a regular uh, on the show. He comes and uh, asks questions every week. Usually relates to growing things from seed. So I look forward to your question this morning. Lynn Winstanley, um, with all the lovely rain, uh, it's a good morning to stay in and watch my favourite show. Lynn, thank you very much. And you're in Perth, and I believe that Perth is getting bombarded with rain. Here in Melbourne, uh, the first day of the Melbourne International Flower and Garden Show was definitely a bit challenging, I've got to tell you. But uh, the weather yesterday and the weather today has improved dramatically and we, um, we're really enjoying very, very big numbers of people here in Melbourne. And of course, it's an exciting time over here. Not only is the Garden Show on, but of course, the Formula One Grand Prix, which I'm sure none of you are interested in, but uh, it makes the, the, the whole vibe of the city very exciting. Now, we'll keep rolling along. Claire Jenkins, um, I've got spongy cooch grass. <laughs> do I have to wait into spring to get it verde mode or could I do it sooner? Uh, or is there anything else that I could do to reduce the sponge? Now, raking isn't giving you, you much there. So you're finding that, oh, and you're in Perth as well. So look, uh, Claire, and, and for anybody out there that's thinking about renovating a lawn, whether it be coring or whether it be doing something like um, verde mowing, which is a uh, vertical blades cutting through and basically ripping the, the grass up, now is not the time uh, to be to be doing that. It needs to be in the growing season. Typically, I would be doing it around about October, November in Perth, and that's because the, the, the season is guaranteed to be warmed up. Temperatures 
average day temperatures are over 25 and we'll see good recovery from that, um, that stress that uh, the lawn does go through. There is a couple of things you can do that will help get rid of sponginess in, in all types of lawns and it, and it goes for buffalo as well. There's a product we talk about all the time, in fact we'll have a, um, a giveaway today, that is Troforte. It's absolutely fantastic but one of the things that makes it so special, Troforte M, and that M standing for microbes, is that some of the microbes are very bioactive. They get into dead and decaying material like thatch in lawns and they'll eat it and convert it into nutrients. And now's a terrific time to be applying that over. Now there's a, a version of, uh, of Troforte M called Fertolawn, and that's the one that you wanna use if you wanna try and reduce your thatch load. It's not gonna be a complete solution, but certainly if you do it now, the thatch will be broken down, your lawn will get fed during the winter months, hopefully sustain some growth, and then come, well, for you in Caversham, come, I would say, October, uh, you can definitely give it a bit of a renovation if you want to do it. Um, that's probably the best thing we can suggest at this moment in time. Now, folks, keep your questions flowing through. There, there's certainly a, um, a lot coming in, but um, just let me know where you're from. Uh, very important. And uh, if there's um, a, a photograph or anything else that you can share with us, that always also helps. Tyson, you did come through with your question. Uh, Tyson is from Baronia in Victoria. Um, can I plant radish seeds in the ground or are they better somewhere else? They're actually far better in the ground. Radish is such a fast growing vegetable um, and now is the best time to get them in, Tyson. So nice sunny spot, free draining soil, get them into the ground. In six weeks time, you want to be harvesting just about all those radish that you have planted. Cherie Bold is, uh, is going to join or has joined us um, from Bunyap in Victoria. Good, we're getting people coming through. Um, people coming through from a uh, heap actually from Victoria here. Um, your question's a good one. Can I grow some dwarf sun uh, flowers in pots from seeds? Can I do it this time of the year? I've never tried growing them. Any tips would be appreciated. Look, sunflowers are usually better when the days are getting longer, not shorter. In saying that, I've been planting some just traditional sunflowers uh, in the last few weeks and they're all about yay big at the moment and starting to grow really strongly and we will definitely get in mild conditions uh, lovely sunflowers coming through with the dwarfs i've just actually had a crop of dwarfs at home myself and uh, they're just finishing and i'm just collecting the seed i will plant those seeds in the springtime though and certainly in pots they're fantastic so um it's your call i would suggest in bunyap in victoria that you are probably better to wait until the days are getting longer, not shorter. Hopefully that helps. Hi, Christine Rankin, you're, you've are you been on holidays. Um, you're listening in from the Qantas Lounge in Brisbane. Thanks so much for doing that. And Tyson, I hope you heard my uh, my answers for you. Christine, now the question um, for you as you're going to remove your cottonwoods, do crape turtles have intensive root systems? I know you're from Perth and certainly um, that, that's a really good question. Crape myrtles are a pretty slow to establish plant because they do have um, have to get a really good root system in, but they're not invasive. Uh, I wouldn't describe them as invasive in the same way, say, a fig or a, an umbrella tree would be. They don't, um, they won't congregate around broken pipes or anything like that. Uh, as a general comment, they do like to spread, but they take a few years to to um, to establish. Now, just as a, a a point, I suppose, taking the cottonwoods out, which are a type of hibiscus, replacing with crepe myrtles, brilliant idea. Uh, and there are some stunning crepe myrtles out there too. I don't know whether you've checked these out, but there are some called um, diamonds in the dark. There are, there are black foliage crepe myrtle with all different colors available. Have a look at those, um, they are stunning. Lee Henderson, hello. Uh, we're staying in WA just at the moment. Uh, we've got a few coming in from Queensland and WA. Lee Henderson, good morning, Trevor. I prune my white mulberry before the coal comes. Uh, it started producing fruit. Now, I've never had this happen before. You're in Australia, which is uh, uh, south of, of Perth, about an hour and a half or so, nearly two hours south of Perth. It is an unusual thing, but Lee, often that happens when plants have been shocked and you have some unseasonal kind of weather. And we've certainly had some unusual, an unusual summer, I would say. It's a lot cooler than what we had last year. And what's going to happen is it's going to produce a little bit of fruit. That fruit probably won't actually eventuate into anything. It probably won't actually make it to full size. 
But what you'll find with that is that it will um, come springtime, produce flowers, produce fruit, and you'll be fine. So you should be okay. Don't don't panic about it, Lee. Judy Lax is in Queensland. Hello, Judy. Got tomatoes coming up from seeds. Should I leave them to grow now or is it too late to plant them? Look, it's a lot better to be planting them on the other side of of the um, into uh, the warm season, albeit it has been dry now in Queensland and uh, you, you can, depending on where you are, certainly grow tomatoes through the winter. My suggestion for you, this is a little bit different, but my suggestion is consider planting them into a bag, a potting mix. Now, what I mean by that is grab yourself a bag, put four holes in the top of the bag and put eight holes in the bottom. Have the, the bag sitting up on a tray or on some bricks so water can drain through. And then with the holes in the top, the four, plant four tomatoes into that. Now, the reason this works is one, you've got very good potting mix. Two, and the most important thing is that bag heats up with solar energy. The sun will warm that and it'll hold the warmth in the soil. And that's what the tomatoes need. So they should produce fruit. They should produce um, a, a reasonable crop during the winter. But the thing that you will have as an advantage is as you go into the, the, the warmer season, you'll get a very early crop in the warmer season. All right, now I'm trying to stay on top of all these questions coming through, which thank you very much for sending them through. Um, Christy Lee Payne, um, I think your question is, how do you keep a pepino melon healthy? Pepinos are an interesting plant. They, um, they are very much like a melon. Um, they are related in actual fact to tomatoes, the, the Solanum family. And um, the trick with them generally is to have them in a bright sunny position. Now, if yours has been a bit unhealthy, don't be scared to take some cuttings and literally take some cuttings about that long and then um, pop them into a glass of water. Pepinos will just drop roots straight into the water and then use those new plants to go into different places in the garden. But look for a full sun position, really, really important. That's probably the most important thing I can suggest to you. Now, um, Audrey, uh, Audrey Urina is uh, from Canning Vale. Hello, Audrey. It's pouring with rain now, which is a blessing. Um, yes, you're saying that your irrigation hasn't been working too well lately. Uh, your question is, some of the shrubs have been affected by lack of deep watering. Can I severely cut the brown bits off now uh, or will that affect the overall growth? Uh, this is actually quite a common um, problem like like Ireland last week they'd had a long period of time 10 weeks with just about no rainfall at all and there were some really severely affected trees and you know whole branches dying back now that's happening because root system is being affected and, and roots are dying and of course those roots provide the nutrients to those branches so you start to see in the tree reflection of what's happening in the ground and you're quite right deep watering is the key what I would be doing right now is I would be applying sea salt all around the base of this plant, um, really giving it a good drench and soak into the soil. And then I would prune back all of the dead bits. So when you say brown bits, if it's dead, take it off. And with that sea salt going in, do not feed it by the way, just use sea salt. That is a plant tonic or a sink and it'll get the soil nice and healthy. It'll get the roots recovering quickly. And once the roots have recovered, then you can feed it and support any new growth. Okay how's how's this going we are rolling along um christine no problems thanks trevor we'll definitely check out that range of crepe myrtles enjoy the melbourne garden show i'll make it there one day you should do it, it is a great event um you can probably hear the chaos behind us there are thousands of school kids here this morning they're having an absolute ball okay let's head to rockhampton carlene counter um what's the best spray to put on for white fly now, whitefly is a significant problem at the moment. I'm hearing it all over the country. Anybody who's growing um, any of the brassicas, that's things like broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, any of those um, are experiencing some significant problems and it's, it's completely understandable. So um, what you've got to do here um, is probably, um, is give it a good drench um, and when I say that, a, a really strong saturation spray of either pest oil or you could use natural soap and you spray under the foliage and over the foliage, but under the foliage is critically important. So it's one of those few times you'll turn um, the wand, the spray wand upside down and you'll shoot upwards and you need to spray under every single plant. Now, if it's a combination of the two, so natural soap, one spray, and then in a week's time, 
do use a white oil, um, pest oil, one of those, um, you should break the cycle, but you have to do it again in about 14 to 16 days if you want to really wipe out the majority of the population. Hopefully that helps. Sorry, it's quite a expanded um, explanation, but it's really critical you do it properly, otherwise you won't get rid of them. If everybody gets uh, the white oil spray or the, the, the natural soap and they spray over the foliage, and in actual fact, they're under the foliage, so that's why you've got to do it. Glenn Miller, Glenn's uh, a great supporter of ours. Thanks, mate. Uh, you're joining us from the Gold Coast. You've got a 15 meter mango tree. Um, you don't think it's ever been trimmed back. Uh, we've only, you've only been there for three years. Okay, so how far should you prune it back to improve fruiting? We've only cut back, cut back one side of the tree this year, and then the other half next year. Is that the right way to go? These are the questions uh, that Glenn is asking. They're really good questions, Glenn. Um, in actual fact, probably cutting back half the tree is a big mistake. What I would suggest you do is you look at thinning branches out of the tree. So you bring a whole bunch of, uh, maybe you reduce the, 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 the amount of growth by about 50%, but take branches back uh, randomly across the tree so that you have some that are remaining, some that are cut back. They all start to shoot buds. And as soon as they start to push out new growth, you go through and you cut back all the others. And the tree will balance itself out as those others produce new shoots. And that'll, you don't want to cut half a tree. It doesn't look good. And um, it really doesn't achieve what you're trying to do here. Uh, let's keep moving through. We've got, uh, we've got lots of good questions coming through. Heather Teller, now you're in Trafalgar in Victoria. I've noticed banana trees growing in our local Bunnings um, or sold at your local Bunnings recently. Do you think I'd be able to grow a banana in a large pot on a veranda that gets afternoon sun? Uh, certainly the afternoon sun is the go, the... Banana, so just on bananas, bananas are actually, um, they are a really interesting plant. They're actually a herb and uh, it's all about the root system. So they, they grow a big base, basal sort of stem in the ground and the banana, the shoot you see that comes out, is actually just all foliage. There's no, no hardwood in that at all. And of course the flower comes from the very base all the way up through. So what I'm really telling you here is you're going to grow it in a pot needs to be in a really big pot. Um, will it grow? Absolutely. As long as it's protected from frosts, you shouldn't have any problems. And typically a banana will produce fruit in around 28 months from you planting it out. So um, I think Bunnings are probably doing a good thing to allow everybody to, to give it a try. But just remember they are a, a, a tropical plant, so they do want protection from cold. They do want to be planted in a nice warm position Afternoon sun, absolutely perfect. Irene Fraser, hello Irene. Um, now let's have a look, you've got a seed grown avocado growing. Uh, it's just started fruiting in the past couple of years. Is there a way to know when they're ready to pick? Or is it just pick, um, just pick one and, and see? So in actual fact, um, wait until they get to the full size of the fruit. So it depends on the, on the variety, but basically as soon as they get to full size, pick them then leave them for four to five days and they'll ripen for you naturally. So that's the best way to go. If you get to the point where they're falling off the tree, fine, but they tend to get damaged. So I'd avoid that if, if I could. Um, okay, we are technically just about up to speed. So we're gonna to go to the interview with Craig Taverner. He's the CEO of the Nursery and Garden Industry Victoria, who are hosting this amazing event, Mifcus. Craig Tavern is the CEO of the Nursery and Garden Industry of Victoria. And we're very fortunate to have him joining us today because there's a big event going on at the moment that you guys have been involved with for a long period of time, the Melbourne International Flower and Garden Show, and it's all just starting to happen before our very eyes, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's been ticking on for near on 26 years. So it uh, kicks off Wednesday, 29th of March through to uh, Sunday, 2nd of April, so over five days. Um, Expect a hundred thousand plus visitors through the uh, through the door over, wow. over that period. You know, this is this is one that if you haven't, if you even if you're not a garden lover, you can go to this and just walk around and be wowed. And you can be wowed for for hours because there are so many different elements to this. You know, if you just want to go and buy a few little, you know, groovy little plants, you can pop into Garden Express or to one of the other retailers that are there. But if you if you want to be inspired. There's also some world-class garden designers, both local and also international, joining this year's event, right? 
Yes, yeah, absolutely. I think that, that we have uh, 10 show gardens on display this year. So again, they're your high-end um, landscape designed uh, gardens. They are a, a crowd favourite. I know we have uh, Peter Donigan coming across from Dublin. So I know I'm looking forward to uh, yeah. seeing what he designs. Yeah, we've interviewed and, Peter. He, he's such a charming character and such a, an interesting guy, but his designs are amazing. Uh, but it's not just about these show gardens as well, because you've got um, you know the avenue of achievable, achievable gardens. That's always one that a lot of people relate to. Yes, yeah, that, that's a, a showstopper, which is uh, driven by nursery and gardeners in Victoria, mm -hmm. something we're very proud of. Uh, it's been going for about 16 years now. But the key for me is that they're working in a five by four meter space. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it's expected if they deliver that at the show, that consumers coming to the event have the opportunity to actually deliver the same in their own um, backyard. So that's sort of the focus on it. So it is really achievable for the consumer. So yeah, mm -hmm. really looking forward to that uh, this year and the the four uh, educational institutions and what the students will deliver. Um, there's also this element, and it's something I'm very conscious of, is that every year you get the the foremost experts in horticulture, all the media um, talent, they all come to the show and they do talks and they meet the, meet the audiences and crowds. You have television shows like The Garden Gurus and Better Homes and Gardens, and uh, I'd imagine even probably Costa and, and Gardening Australia will turn up. So you know, it, there's a lot of excitement and there's a lot of opportunity to learn. Oh, absolutely, said it, it, It's fantastic to have so many um, things happening in this one space over those five days. There's also a number of presentations that occur throughout the week. So there is a main stage where there is um, engaging um, speakers talking about homegrown activities and how you can advance your gardening prowess um, on the home front. And so lots of learnings there. There's floristry um, workshops. Also, I know there's a mini, mini terrarium um, activation. Yeah. So lots of little hands-on activities that can help educate and inspire you. But, but from, from my side, one thing I'm very um, excited about where, what we're delivering this year is what's called Grow Your Future. Okay. So that's a space introducing people to a career in horticulture. So right. when people come to that site, they can understand what's going on they can talk to someone about a career and how their educational pathway works. So that's something new to the show this year and something we're pretty excited about for visitors. This is a showcase of the best of, of horticulture, of landscape and floriculture in Australia and, and you're attracting the very best there. So it's the premier event and it's it's all going to kick off on the 29th of March and conclude on the 2nd of April. It's going to be a busy week in Melbourne that week. You've got the Grand Prix as well. It's all happening. Uh, it is, and the AFL would have just kicked off. So, yeah, it's certainly a really busy time for us. But I think, like you know, Trevor, very exciting. And I think it's a pinnacle for us, the, the premier horticultural event, uh, top-notch in so Southern Hemisphere. And said, so all we can do is uh, encourage people to come to Melbourne and experience the, the event. Yeah. They won't look back. Um, yeah, numbers just keep increasing year on year. So, yeah, very exciting time ahead. Good luck with it all, mate. I, I really appreciate your time this morning. No, thank you, Trevor, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you across in Melbourne uh, in a few weeks' time. You absolutely will. All right, mate, see you then. Okay, thank you. See ya. One of my favourite garden aesthetics has to be bulb meadows. They're simple to create and you can use an assortment of perennial bulbs in your lawns or in established garden beds. And what will happen, they will naturalise and they will create mass displays of beautiful flowers. The key to a meadow display is a variety of different bulbs and lots of them. Also having bulbs that flower at slightly different stages or that crossover will allow for a longer flowering window. And now is the perfect time to be planting all your spring flowering bulbs. So there is a number of different bulbs here. We've got Babiana, which is a beautiful small flowering bulb that will bloom later in the season. We've got some Dutch Iris, we've got Ixia, and then we've got Freesias, which are a magical fragrant plant. We've also got Jonquils, which are earlier flowering. And then we've got Ranunculus. Now, before planting these, make sure you soak them in a little bit of water for about 30 minutes, and that will plump them up, and that way you'll get really good flowering later on. As for maintenance, there isn't too much to do, and that is what makes this garden style so appealing. 
Create your own flower meadow with the Spring Bulb Warm Collection from Garden Express. Get 111 bulbs for only $55, which is a saving of 30%. Head over to their website to discover the collection. Hello, welcome to The Garden Gurus. I'm Trevor Cochran. Talk about inspiration. This is the jewel at Changi Airport in Singapore. Look at it, it is just remarkable. One of my favourite garden aesthetics has to be bulb meadows. And you can use an assortment of perennial bulbs in your lawns or in established garden beds. Like most things in life, keeping your lawn healthy will keep it looking good. Regular mowing and fertilising helps to keep it thick and light. Now most of Singapore's food is actually imported. Every kilo of produce here is about four to six kilos less of carbon emissions compared to that that's brought in. <laughs> Wow, there's a lot there to, uh, to take in. Now we are live here at the Melbourne International Flower and Garden Show. My name is Trevor Cochran and it's great to have you join us this morning. Now look, it's all about answering your questions for the next half an hour or so. So let's get them in, send them through and uh, I will do my very best to answer them for you in the time we have available. Now I've got uh, a lot of Lynn Win Stanley. Now you mentioned before Lynn, um, a lot of rain in Perth. Uh, and you're, uh, you're from Claremont. Um, it seems that I might have missed your question. If I did, I'm sorry. How do you treat thrip on moraes? Well, first thing you need to know is that thrip are not very active during the cold season. So as we're moving into winter, um, what you're probably seeing is significant damage now that was done a while ago, are showing through. The best thing you can do is go through, grab yourself a big black plastic bag, trim your moraes down, throw it all in, into that, then I wouldn't do anything. I probably wouldn't even spray them. I'd let the winter cold kill off those thrips. Um, they will bounce back. They lay eggs in the soil during the, the, the late autumn and then they'll come back out in spring. Now, treating them, uh, I can tell you what I'm going to do in my garden. I am going to get some predatory mites. There are two types that are very effective against thrips and mites. And I'm going to hunt them down um, come probably September and then release them into my garden when they arrive in the mail in October. Now you can order them online. Uh, it seems to me that this is the most effective way to really control thrips. Thrips and mites are quite remarkable. They become very resistant to chemical treatments quite quickly. And you'll find you're having to pour more and more chemicals on to try and beat them. And uh, they, they're evolving, they're becoming tolerant to it. So um, the best thing you can do is bring a predatory mite in. Now the the number one thing you need to keep in mind is that you can't spray uh, chemicals or insecticides uh, around once you put your predatory mites in. They're a little more susceptible to chemical treatments. Um, and look, once they're, they're in there and they're growing and they're healthy, they're feeding off the, the mites and thrips that you've got in your garden. So this is a nice natural way to do it. The question you're going to ask is where do you get them? Uh, the aren't online and um, just Google good bugs and you'll find that uh, it'll come up and it'll show there. So yeah, so that's um, that's pretty much that treatment and that control for you. Um, we're gonna go to, we're gonna stay in Perth for a second. And you've had a terrible problem with chili thrip for the second season on your standard roses. I would say to you and that um, we are starting to see some natural build up of some predators for the chili thrip and you do not want to Look, I would suggest that you, they're going to go dormant during the cold season. Uh, they will emerge come springtime, and I would use that same advice I just gave, and that is to bring in some predatory mites. Um, they will eat those chili thrips, and the more predatory mites you have in the garden, I think you buy them in tubes, there's about 100,000 in tube, but within two to three weeks, you've got a million, and they're eating a million predatory thrips, uh, sorry, uh, thrips or mites, and you find that your populations all balance out. Uh, the, the bit that you can't do is you can't be spraying and particularly any of those uh, nicot nicotoid uh, style um, insecticides, they're really, really bad and they do last in the soil for a long time too. So um, 
maybe not a short-term solution, but certainly the long-term solution, I think, is to head in this direction. Okay, let's have a quick look. We've got a question from Chris. Not quite sure where you're from. Um, you haven't put that in here, but wondering if you could advise me on how to replant my hydrangea. It was planted in too much shade by the previous owners, and I'd like to dig it up and replant it in a different place. Easy one, Chris. Soak the ground now with sea salt. Leave it for until June. Oh, where are we? Uh, I'd say leave it till June when things have gone dormant and it's dropped its foliage. Dig it up, transplant it then. They transplant really well during the winter months when they've gone dormant. Very simple one. When you put it into the new hole, water it again with sea salt. Come October, November, you will see some really significant growth, flower bud production, and it'll be like in, in you know, completely recovered, so in the right spot. Uh, let's keep rolling down. There's quite a few here. Uh, Christine Piper, I've got large salvias that need pruning, but they're in flower. They become quite woody and the bees are, are abundant, so you're reluctant to prune them. I agree with you. Don't prune them right now. Leave it till probably May. Give them a prune in May, and that's the best time to do it, uh, Christine, and they will bounce back, grow steadily through the winter months. Um, before they come back into flower in the spring, before you see flower bud production, give them one more prune, and it'll just make some nice and bushy, and they'll do a really good job. Uh, so hopefully that will help. Um, Mary Rozeknik Hisrik, I'm gonna, I hope I didn't butcher your name, Mary, I'm sorry. Um, can you put those insects on orchids? Well, the answer is predatory mites and um, predatory insects can absolutely be put on orchids. If you're seeing a large, and normally orchids, um, particularly cymbidiums, are affected by red spider mite. And yes, you can put predatory mites in there, and yes, they will take control of it. So hopefully, that helps. Now, uh, we'll keep rolling along. Rogers in Perth, I've got a shady area that I'd like to grass. The area gets about three to four hours of sunlight a day in summer and a bit less in winter. What type of grass would you recommend? I wouldn't recommend grass, Roger. I would recommend that you go for dichondra. Um, there is even uh, some, there is actually some really lovely, you're in Perth, uh, Banara Nurseries produce some really lovely ground cover alternatives. And one that's doing really well in shady spots in my garden, better than Dichondra, is a, a wonderful little um, prostate growing peppermint. And so it's thick, it's green. Um, you can see it's different, obviously, to lawn. It's not the same foliage. But the great thing about it is as it starts to grow up, you run the lawnmower over the top of it as you would. And you've got this wonderful peppermint um, fragrance that wafts through the garden. So. Um, you need an alternative. Grasses will not grow with just three to four hours of sunlight and particularly less in the winter, uh, they will all die out. So hopefully that helps. Okay, um, let's keep rolling along because we were talking, we actually had the uh, the promo for Garden Express pop up earlier on and it's a really, uh, really, really good deal. 111 bulbs. I'm not sure who's counting this, but anyway, the guys at Garden Express, they know what they're doing. Um, Babiana, uh, black pearl lilies, Dutch iris, there's freesias, there's ixia, jonquil. A lot of these are really good for warmer, drier climates too. So um, uh, tritonia, ranunculite. Now, ranunculite are getting quite rare to get hold of. There's a bit of a story. So make sure you check that out. It's gardenexpress.com.au. And of course, they're your 24 hour a day, seven day a week garden center. And they deliver direct to your doorstep. Um, I am going to try and jog across all of your questions as they're coming through. We will go to uh, Marie Peter Sands. Sweet peas, I don't have any luck. What hints can you give me? I'm in Northern Victoria. Um, Marie, the very first thing I will tell you is that the, the best time to plant sweet peas is on Anzac Day. That's the day when, uh, when my grandfather taught me that you should put them in and you always end up with a great crop. What I do suggest you do is we would always dig in chicken, cow or horse manure into the soil. We'd let it settle for at least before we went planting those seeds. Um, really, really important that um, you do enrich the soil and using manures with sweet peas seems to be the best way to go. Controlled release fertilizers definitely do it, but um, they release slowly and it's um, with sweet peas, it's that early boost that you really want to see. Um, let's go to South Australia. Um, Margaret Best. Hello, Margaret. You're from uh, Port Broughton in Upper. Um, you are.
Uh, in Upper, I'm just watching these things scroll through, uh, Upper York Peninsula. Um, you planted some tube stock grevilleas, but they're not thriving. What can I do to give them a boost? Soil's quite sandy for the most part. Uh, could you be overwatering them? Uh, absolutely. It depends on the types because uh, there's a lot of lot of grevilleas that originate from um, northern New South Wales. So they have basically wet, warm summers and uh, they expect to be watered. Then those that originate from sort of the central sort of Midwest area of, of Western Australia, they love it hot and dry during the summer. The big trick with all of these, I think, is to plant them as tube stock in the winter, not in the summer. Um, then you've got natural rainfall as a general comment uh, that allows them to settle in, establish a root system and get going. Uh, so right at the moment, if there's anything you could do, probably apply some sea sol over them. It's always good for them. Uh, and uh, when you do start to see growth, which will come during the winter months and they will recover at that point, support them with some good controlled Pretty straightforward. Hopefully that helps you. Margaret, um, lovely having you join us from South Australia. Uh, Mary's got another question for me. Uh, I've got hyacinths from Garden Express yesterday at the show. But do I need to put the bulbs in the fridge first? The answer is no, the, the flowers are already set, Mary. So uh, they would have been set around October, November last year. Uh, and you'll be, you'll be guaranteed a really good crop this year. But there's the lesson in what you do. So if you want to get um, some really good results, um, if you can have a really cold, chilly November for them, that'll allow those bulbs after they flowered and died back down to reset their flower bulbs, um, for their flower buds, I should say, for the next flowering period, the next spring. Interesting. Um, Irene, you've asked the question. Uh, curious to know why ranunculi are scarce. Um, so the answer to it is that um, there were, I think, at least three, possibly five families um, growing ranunculi here in Victoria. And um, three of them have, uh, have sold their farms. There's pretty much one major one there who's trying to cover the shortfall. Um, what's happening is, uh, you know, these the, the land that these bulbs have been grown on is now with a lot of money and, and the people who've been growing them uh, are, are moving on in age and have decided to sell. And so that's actually caused a shortfall. Hopefully the industry bounces back and you will see a, um, you know, an improvement. But at this moment in time, there is a shortfall in supply. Uh, let's keep rolling along. Chris, we're not sure where you're from. Uh, you've been watching the TV show. Thank you very much. You'd like to ask about aphids. Um, you've got them in your, so you've got citrus aphids, uh, they're in your lemon tree. Uh, it's been two years, you didn't have any fruits because of them, which can happen when they're prolific. Tried so many sprays, but they don't work. The last spray I used is eco oil. Eco oil is probably not as effective as, as you'd really like. Uh, it will do the job, don't get me wrong. Uh, you really want to be using a pyrethrum base, a synthetic pyrethrum or, or one of those um, sprays to get really good control if you want to do that. What's actually really going on here is your citrus are not healthy. Um, that means that the new growth that comes through, the cell structure is quite thin, which allows the aphids to drill in and draw the, the moisture out of those cells. And it deforms the new, it's usually the new growth where they get into. So what you really want to do is you want to be using a fertilizer that's going to strengthen the cell wall to, to really get them nice and strong. And that's where something like Troforte is so good uh, because it's not just feeding the soil, um, the microbes are coming in and they're really enhancing the plant's health. And, and that's a really critical thing. So my suggestion to you is that probably what you want to do is actually look at feeding your citrus and using a citrus fertilizer and probably worry less about the, the insects just at the moment. Um, you can spray, but I'm not sure how big a deal that's going to be for you um, with regards to getting full control. Okay, let's keep rolling through. You're all taking advantage of the fact that um, you've got this uh, this run for questions. We've got 20 minutes to go. Lee Henderson, you're back. Looking for some recommendations for lawn that's suitable for pets with skin allergies and that is also drought tolerant. All right, a really good, good question actually, Lee. Um, on the Garden Gurus, uh, you're gonna see Lydia Pethick join us uh, in, in the, over the next few weeks. And Lydia's giving us a few tips on uh, some things that she's passionate about. She's actually a vet and uh, she has some really good advice with regards to uh, plants and pets and how you can try and uh, separate the two when it comes to some of those things that cause allergies. And 
when we're talking about lawns, typically buffalo grasses, some of those broader leaf lawns, do cause problems for pets that have got sensitive skin. So fine leaf grasses are always a, a good way to go. Zoysia, not too bad, but I would be suggesting you look at a cooch grass. Um, there's probably, uh, well, there's a number of cultivars to be quite honest out there. They would all be good for pets. You're looking for something that's softer. If you're living in a cooler climate, um, some of those tall fescues and perennial rye are also really, really good. So it just depends on where you're based, Lee. But, but my suggestion would be uh, stick with something like a, a fine leaf, um, yeah, a, a cooch or, you know, wintergreen is a, is a really good form of that that you just can't go wrong with. Sandy Jewell, hello, Sandy. Um, let's have a look here. You're fighting an influx of mealybug and it's out of control and, uh, you, and you're not happy. I understand. Mealybug's a really hard one to control and typically in a, in a nursery environment or in a commercial garden, a systemic insecticide would be used because they often get right into the crevices of the plant and they'll get into the root system. And that way, using a systemic, it's usually taken up by the roots and moves through the foliage. And anything that punctures that and sucks on the sap, which is what mealybug do, is then killed off. So you could go down that path. There are some insects also that, that do attack mealybug. And mealybug's another one that in the cold uh, will go dormant and will tend to move down into the roots and into the, the really sort of protected spots of the plant. So treating at the moment with a spray is probably not going to be overly effective. You could spray them early in the season. That's going to help. The other thing you could do is introduce some predatory mites that would um, predate those mealybug. And again, I wouldn't bother about doing it until probably September, as soon as the weather warms, probably September, uh, depending on where you are. Hopefully that helps. Um, now, let's keep moving through. We've got, I'll tell you what we need to do. You're, you're absolutely right. Jimmy's just reminded me, we have got a um, fantastic $250 Triforte gift pack and hamper. And of course, that is um, something that you will get the code word for. We will pop that up pretty soon, I would think. Um, the other thing that you need to be aware of is we've got a $50 gift vouch from the guys at Garden Express. So I'm going to pick a winner from today's show and uh, that will most definitely um, be a, a really wonderful way to go because it means that immediately after the show you can go shopping with Garden Express and uh, make sure you enter the chance to win the gift hamper from um, Troforte. It'll give you enough Troforte to keep the garden looking good for at least six months. It's a, it's a fantastic prize. And once you've tried this, it's pretty hard to go back, so give it a shot. All right, now I'm going to try to keep moving through your questions. Uh, Monica has asked, uh, how do I enter the Singapore competition? You've been following the show. You will have seen that we're running a trip for two to Singapore. Uh, you'll be flying Scoot and you will be staying at one of, or in fact, I think you're staying at both of, the magnificent Park Royal hotels. That's Park Royal Pickering, Park Royal, um, Park Royal Marina Bay. Now, Park Royal Marina Bay uh, has a beautiful internal garden it's just stunning, multi-story, absolutely incredible. They call that the garden in a hotel. And then Park Royal Pickering has this magnificent external garden. It's got internal gardens too, but it's got over 17, 18,000 square meters of stunning gardens wrapped around the outside of the hotel. And um, that's known as the hotel in a garden. And the answer to your question is you need to go online and you need to use the answers that I just gave you. They are the answers. So it's the hotel in a garden, garden in a hotel. And that will help you with regards to entering that competition. Fancy winning a trip for two to Singapore, staying at those hotels, enjoying some amazing meals and exploring what is really one of the most stunning garden cities on the planet. It really is lovely. So Monica, that's that's my little uh, bit of help for you. Hopefully that does help. Glenis, I'm not sure where you're from. Just wondering if I could help you with my Daphne as they keep dying. You know, I was with Anthony Tesla yesterday. Anthony has some pretty amazing plants. You know, Flower Carpet Rose has just been inducted into the Hall of Fame. He also introduced a Daphne called um, Perfume Princess. Now, it's got a pink form, which has been out for a few years. And there's another one, which is a white form, is coming out too. Stunningly perfumed, laden with foliage. And the reason I'm telling you about this is that Daphne, traditional Daphne, 
uh, have a bit of a problem with viruses. And they get this viral buildup and they start dropping their leaves and you end up with only little buds and sometimes you'll get flowers and sometimes you won't and eventually they'll die back. I would suggest that your Daphne has got a virus and it's slowly dying and I would take the plant out, I would wrap it up in a plastic bag and I'd pop it into the bin uh, or I'd pop it into a fire and I would burn it. It's, sorry, it's really dramatic, I know. But I would be planting one of the ones that I just talked about, the Perfume Princess, because that particular plant is really resistant to viruses. They don't seem to have any viral load in them at all. And they just grow like crazy and they're a beautiful big plant. And they produce masses and masses of flowers. And the perfume, it's intoxicating. It is absolutely sensational. So, um, yeah, that's my recommendation. Okay, I think we're doing pretty well here. Um, this is our first question I think we've ever had come from New Zealand. And it's fantastic to have you join us. Um, I will, I will uh, sort of run through this in a second, but I will make the make the point of saying to you that um that i'm no expert when it comes to new zealand many many times but i'll give you my best advice now this is jill from walkworth in new zealand uh, i've got a very healthy passion fruit growing on a timber fence it had lots of flowers uh, and a few of them formed fruit but it's now disappeared it's now flowering again is the culprit the harlequin bugs um that's taking the fruit off well to be quite honest, once the fruit forms, it'd be unlikely the harlequin bug would take it out. What would be more likely is rats or mice taking it off the vine. And that's a very common problem with, uh, with passion fruit. They do like the sugars that are inside the fruit. And so they will tear that fruit out. So my suggestion would be that you might want to put a couple of traps just around the outside to see whether that's what the real problem is. Uh, there is a couple of things. Um, if they go through any stress, they'll drop their fruit sometimes. The other thing is that um, what helps them set fruit is humidity. So a little tip for anybody growing passion fruit, it doesn't matter where you are, if, if the weather's a bit on the drier side um, and they're producing flowers, get the hose out and just hose roughly over the foliage just to increase that humidity. It really helps with a fruit set. Uh, it's one of those little tricks that one of the uh, professional growers shared with me many years ago and I, I still use it at home. And um, we, I probably don't grow my passion fruit in the most ideal place. It's kind of semi-shaded and they really need full sun, but my crops are more than enough to keep the family uh, in passion fruit pulp uh, pretty much most of the year. Okay, hopefully that helps and it's great to have you join us from New Zealand. Jill, that's terrific. Um, Tracy is in Adelaide, hello. We've got a three-year-old lemon tree in a pot. It's growing big lemons, but they've been green for a couple of months and it is just the time of the year you are going to see things change, Tracy. Um, in the next month, they'll start um, getting color into them. I've got exactly the same thing. You've probably got a Eureka lemon as well. And uh, they are later at the moment in coloring up. So it feels like the fruit's just sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. You just gotta be a little bit patient. There's nothing you can do to make them turn yellow. All right, let's keep rolling through. We've got, we've, I don't know what that is because it's, it's gone. I'm getting messages coming through. Let's do the Troforte uh, um, code word. And the code word for Troforte is plants. So comment it um, on the Troforte M Facebook page. Go to that, put plants on, put your details and good luck because it's a great prize. Um, absolutely sensational. Thanks to our friends from Troforte for supporting us with that and supporting us with this show. Now we have 10 minutes left to go. 10 minutes of questions, um, your big chance. Let's have a look here. Fruit and flowers are disappearing. How can that be managed? Pretty much goes back to that same, um, same answer I gave just before for New Zealand. More often than not, uh, ex extreme changes in weather. For example, uh, I had great crop of avocados. This, we moved into summer, soil dried out a lot of the fruit because it knew it couldn't sustain that fruit um, with the amount of moisture available to the roots. So it actually naturally thins itself. Um, this often happens with plants. Uh, consistency in supply of moisture is really, really important. If you're not getting flour, more often than not, putting a high, a high K fertilizer in um, will really help. So a specialized fruit fertilizer is the way to go. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps. It's a few little general tips anyway. Uh, can you cut the top of a large ficus plant off and regrow? Depends on the type of ficus. Now, if it's um, if it, they all grow from cutting, I should qualify that. 
but if you want to take a larger cutting, uh, the rubber tree, the, the classic uh, ficus elastica, there's a few different forms of it, rubra and so on, so the, the darker foliage or the redder foliage or the variegated foliage, they will all grow quite well. You probably want a cutting around about 100 millimetres. Cut all the leaves off and then go from there. And you'll find that that is it's pretty much going to do the job for you. Um, okay, so we've gone from um, Adelaide to Queensland and now we are going to go to um, the south coast of New South Wales. Jenny Elliott, hello. What can I do with my azaleas? They've turned brown underneath, badly infected. It's more than likely um, azalea lace bug. And this one's a pretty vicious one. It, you, again, there are predatory insects out there now that could actually do the job for you. And um, you would jump online, you would get them sent to you. But I don't know if the damage is really bad that that's the best way to go. I actually think you probably should spray in this instance. And using a... Um, I would go to your local garden centre and I would ask them for a systemic insecticide. Really important systemic. And I would spray under the plant and over the foliage as much as you can. And that will help. But all the damaged foliage is going to drop. So what you want to do is you want to go and give it a feed as well. So an azalea camellia fertiliser, specialised fertiliser, best way to go. And something that's fast moving is going to generate a fair bit of, um, fair bit of growth activity. Kerry Height, um, you've got a heat coat lavender. You planted them two years ago. They're yet to flower. Now you're in Fremantle, so you're in WA, and they're in an easterly position. Interestingly enough, Fremantle's the perfect place to grow um, lavender, um, really good place to grow. But you do want to have them on a north face. You don't want to have them in any shade at all. Um, but look, they're not going to flower now. They're going to flower um, winter, spring. So. Don't go doing too much to them just at the moment. If you're going to do anything, don't be scared to give them a trim, keep them in shape. In fact, all lavender right now would benefit from that. And of course, the next thing they're going to do is start producing flower buds from there and they'll be nice and compact. So that's a good way to go. Uh, Heather Teller, um, where's the best place to get Troforte? You haven't seen it in any local garden centre or hardware stores. Now, look, it's sold through specialised garden centres and the uh, best thing you can do is, if you're not sure where your local one is, go to their website. It's uh, treforte.com.au, I'm pretty sure is the, the website, but you could Google that and just check that as well. Um, Kathy Mary Davidson, hello. Uh, you're, again, another one we've got from WA today. It's great. Uh, Pinjara, it's wet and windy. And finally, your garden's getting a great water. You know, it's, it's the strangest thing, of course, is that we end up in a situation where we you know we're getting wet in the west after a long period without any rainfall. And we're being so wet in the, the north and New South Wales and Queensland. Um, it's all been very dry just recently. And people are starting to ask me questions up there about plants drying out and showing dry stress. Isn't it crazy? We live in a big country. OK, now i'm going to roll through a few more questions because we are running out of time we're down to five minutes so let's see how many i can get through uh kate is in victoria something's eating my beautiful lily pilly hedge what can i do to stop this i've seen tiny green caterpillars all right uh definitely uh caterpillar spray i would suggest you go for success uh highly effective or dipel is the other one highly effective really good ones to go i've got another one from um from shaylee in perth hello shaylee um, I've got a variegated monstera and you're very proud of it, but now you're scared you're going to accidentally kill it. Got a number of happy non-variegated monsteras at home. Imagine the care's the same. Um, I don't know I don't know what I'll do to keep it. Actually, there's a really good point with that. And the variegated plants, uh, particularly indoor plants, they're the ones that should be in the brightest positions in the house. That variegation is a lack of chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is where they obviously convert sunlight into energy and, and supports their growth. What you want to do is you want to make sure that the variegated ones closest to the window and the, the green ones, they can be in the darker spots. And as long as you're in a position where it's getting not direct light, but certainly nice bright light, um, you're going to be fine, Shaylee. Great question, by the way. Now, I do have to pick a winner um, today uh, of the best question, and that will get us that, will get the winner a $50 um, Garden Express hamper. So we're just about running out of time um when you do send in your details tell us who you are uh tell us where you are more importantly Rita, you didn't mention where you are so i will um 
I'll take a guess. Can you please tell me what succulents will tolerate full afternoon sun in a clay pot? Let me tell you, I don't know a succulent that won't grow in that environment. They love those conditions, Rita. So go for it. Plant any of them. They're all going to do well for you. Uh, staying in Victoria, Jenny, I need some perennial plants that are in full sun, but from time to time get waterlogged. Um, okay, that is a challenge. Perennials tend to be pretty good because they tend to die down. And when we say perennials, talking about the, the cottage perennials, tend to die down or, or, or go uh, dormant in some form or another during the winter months and then sort of come back. And, you know, Victoria, you know, wet winters, drier summers, um, that's probably a whole range of plants you really could select from a whole bunch here. And what I would suggest you do is um, there is a romantic, there's a range called the Romantic Cottage uh, perennial range have a look for those in your local garden center pretty much all of the selection that sit in there would be fine in that position with the exception maybe of salvias so I'll just take them out and uh, everything else you should be fine with um, Maria thanks so much for joining us Maria Molino um, watching from sunny Sydney today good morning thank you for saying hello uh, Alan Sharon Illman Alan and Sharon Illman I get it uh, best non-toxic way to rid the garden beds of lawn. Really the best way to do it if you don't want to use uh, a herbicide is going to be by hand. It's going to take a bit of digging and then once you've dug it out, put some mulch over, put some paper down first, mulch on top and anything that's remaining, hopefully it'll smother them out. Uh, Gabby Weaver, thank you so much for, um, for saying it's nice to see you back. It's nice to be back. Uh, Barbara Ann, um, getting leaf curling on orange trees. Now, what's causing it? It's actually more than likely the crusader beetle or the bronze orange bug. Both of them really effective this time of the year at getting into the new growth as it starts to, to go and it causes a fair bit of curling. That's on oranges, of course, um, on a lot of other trees, you will get uh, the leaf miner and that's a, another problem again. The difference between the two, the way you treat both of them, it's actually the same. So what I would do is I'd get a white oil spray over the foliage of the plant but don't do it in the beginning of the day do it at the end of the day now that's because uh particularly with a the moth they're most active at the end of the day and they'll start laying their eggs during that period of time but if there's an oily substance on the foliage they don't like it they'll get up and fly off somewhere else and they won't affect your plant so hopefully that helps um gabby thank you so much uh, it's lovely lovely to be back um thanks very much for your very kind comments there uh, let's keep moving through. Gee whiz, uh, I've got to scroll right down here. There's quite a few coming through. Um, Gabby Weaver from Collie. Uh, can I grow dragon fruit in Collie? Absolutely, Gabby. Dragon fruit grow in some quite cool conditions. What you'll find is um, the fruit is a bit later. So you'll find you're actually harvesting around about May, June as a general comment. There are some earlier varieties, but look, that's... Um, that's just how it goes. Heather Teller's just told us she's entered the competition. Good luck for that, Heather. Um, I am rolling across here. This is another one, Irene Fraser. This is a good one. Uh, I've got quite a few grevilleas in my garden, including grafted varieties uh, that wouldn't normally survive my Bundaberg subtropical climate. And the flowers seem to be getting attacked by something. Flowers seem to fall apart and they're very sparse. Now, Irene, I've as well with um, with grevilleas. This is this is going to be my question of the day, I reckon. And it's it's really, it's caused by um, thrips actually getting into the flowers with grevilleas. And I've seen it occurring more and more quite recently. I'm not really sure why they seem to be so focused. It's probably the soft tissue of the flowers. But again, I'm going to recommend that you don't spray because uh, grevillea flowers are really prolific with regards to feeding birds and bees. You don't want to damage their environment and, and obviously their food source and ultimately their population. So I would suggest that you look at getting some predatory insects. So again, go online, Google the good bug. You can order it online. They'll deliver it in the mail too. It comes in a tube. And yes, I would be applying it right now. Okay, let's keep moving down. Uh, Maria Molino, I am going to say Irene Fraser is the winner of our prize. So Shay Lee, We'll, um, we'll get in contact you, with you, Irene. Congratulations. That's a $50 gift voucher to go shopping at Garden Express. Maria Molino, we are right on the, on the line. Um, I've got a lot of dandelions growing in my grass. Is it edible or is it a weed? Now, dandelions are actually, uh, they're edible. Um, the, the flowers um, probably 
make one of the, the nicest teas. They can be a bit bitter, but they're incredibly good for you, very good for digestion. So uh, a little bit there. Um, do I need to hand pollinate my dragon fruit? That's um, uh, Vinette in uh, Ainsberg. I'm not quite sure where you're from. Oh, Bella Dura. Do I need to hand pollinate my dragon fruit? The answer is no, you don't. They will pollinate themselves. There are moths. They tend to be moth pollinated. So that's, um, that's all good. And I think our last two questions for the day. Uh, Jody Malone, um, I, I've tried to grow azaleas in my garden and sun, but they have died. So the winter is completely no sun at all. What do you recommend? Oh, this is just um, it's a big rush. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna get to all your questions. Uh, but what do you recommend? Um, should you be planting for full shade in winter? I would suggest you look at things like hellebores in preference to azaleas. Um, camellias could be good. Uh, that's certainly one way to go. Um, that's probably my answer to you. And the last question of the day goes to Natasha Jones uh, in Northwest Tasmania. Great to have somebody from Tasmania joining us as well. Uh, English Bucks' Hedge. I found that they're looking orange, like they're dying off, dry leaves, etc. Nursery told me to put lime and fertilizer onto them. They're back to looking more orange again, not just a few, but most. Help, they're three years old. Now, interesting thing about buxus is they are a, a plant that does need to have a good free draining soil. They have to have consistent moisture, and when they don't, they do tend to go sort of an orangey color and then start dying back. So I'm wondering whether you might have had a bit of a dry spell or whether you've got some dry pockets in your soil. So I'd be suggesting that you put some wetting agent um, in around the base and then I would be suggesting you use a controlled release plant food. Now, again, that's where um, something like Troforte AM is so good. You basically apply that around the base and it'll feed your plants for six months. So you only have to feed them twice a year. So, yep, you think it could be dry pockets? I think so too. So good luck. I hope that... Um, I hope that that solves the problem for you. Well, that's all we've got for you today. It's been a busy show, lots of questions coming through. Just remind you one more time, if you want to enter that competition to win the Troforte, go to the Troforte Facebook page. The code word is plants. Doesn't get any easier than that, does it? Well, uh, big thanks to everybody. Jimmy here in Melbourne with me who has been producing on this side of things in Perth. She's been doing a great job with Dylan. Um, pulling it all together over there and firing more questions through. I hope you enjoyed today's show. The good news is we are back next week, but I think it's on Thursday next week. I'll have to check that with Shaylee. Um, but yeah, next Thursday, because of course Friday is Easter Friday, if I am correct. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a, a great crowd. You guys have had some terrific questions. Uh, loved spending some time with you. This Behind me is the Melbourne International Flower and Garden Show. You can see it all in the distance there. Um, the spectacular, oh, you can't quite see the exhibition building. Some bad camera work there, isn't there? But uh, that's, that's a, it's a great event and that's what you'll see if you get a chance to come here. If you want to see it, um, maybe from your TV because you can't make it, good news is it'll be on the Garden Gurus coming up. We've got a great show coming up for you tomorrow. You won't see it in tomorrow's show. You We'll see it in a couple of weeks' time, but um, look forward to sharing that with you. I am Trevor Cochran. I will see you again soon for another great episode of The Garden Gurus Live. Hello, welcome to The Garden Gurus. I'm Trevor Cochran. Talk about inspiration. This is the jewel at Changi Airport in Singapore. Look at it. It is just remarkable. <laughs> One of my favourite garden aesthetics has to be bulb meadows. And you can use an assortment of perennial bulbs in your lawns or in established garden beds. Like most things in life, keeping your lawn healthy will keep it looking good. Regular mowing and fertilising helps to keep it thick and light. Now most of Singapore's food is actually imported. Every kilo of produce here is about four to six kilos less of carbon emissions compared to that that's brought in. <laughs>
one of my favorite garden aesthetics has to be bulb meadows. They're simple to create and you can use an assortment of perennial bulbs in your lawns or in established garden beds. And what will happen, they will naturalize and they will create mass displays of beautiful flowers. The key to a meadow display is a variety of different bulbs and lots of them. Also having bulbs that flower at slightly different stages or that crossover will allow for a longer flowering window. And now is the perfect time to be planting all your spring flowering bulbs. So there is a number of different bulbs here. We've got Babiana, which is a beautiful small flowering bulb that will bloom later in the season. We've got some Dutch Iris, we've got Ixia, and then we've got Freesias, which are a magical fragrant plant. We've also got Jonquils, which are earlier flowering. And then we've got Ranunculus. Now, before planting these, make sure you soak them in a little bit of water for about 30 minutes, and that will plump them up, and that way you'll get really good flowering later on. As for maintenance, there isn't too much to do, and that is what makes this garden style so appealing. Create your own flower meadow with the Spring Bulb Warm Collection from Garden Express. Get 111 bulbs for only $55, which is a saving of 30%. Head over to their website to discover the collection.